be having a, a short podcast with you and, and learning a bit more about um, your strategy and how we've been working together at Jackson College. Um, so I guess to kick things off, um, can you describe kind of your strategy and, and, and values at, at Jackson College, just at a, just at a high level? Well, at, at Jackson College, we uh, we pride ourselves on the fact that we're unique in that we are we are addressing students and their particular needs one student at a time. We look at the we look at the whole student, and in understanding the whole student, we are we are fundamentally engaged in the love, care, and service of each individual and what their particular needs are. And we recognize that as an institution of higher learning, we've got a moral obligation to look at students individually rather than in a broad brush format. And in that regard, we begin to understand the unique journey that each student has, some of the challenges and limitations that they have, and what are the services and, and programs and supports that we can bring to bear to be able to assist them. In total, we call this TCS squared, a total commitment to student success. So everything that we do, the decision-making, our protocols, the way we spend our budget, the way we spend our time is given to that love, care, and service approach to students. really really powerful um really powerful message I, I think it's so important that um students are uh, are seen as you know in, in, in individuals with each with their own potential i think the kind of educational system historically has kind of made the mistake of like running a bit more of a kind of one size fits all system which which doesn't really work with a, a group of individuals right so yeah that's re re really positive to hear um and in, in in terms of um sort of some of the key challenges you think the college is facing in in general or i guess maybe even uh, co colleges face in general a bit, bit, bit more broadly than jackson college what what, what what do you think has been been the main things over the last few years well i i think um uh, COVID has really taught us a lot. Uh, there's some good lessons in there and some I wish we could have learned differently. Uh, but one that is very clear to me is that uh, we have an increasing level of responsibility to ensure that we're meeting students where they are and recognizing that not every student is the same. Uh, not all of our students have the ability to access higher education, all the supports, materials, books, the, the whole nine yards. That It's just a different experience for every student. And so in that regard, COVID, I think, has taught us over the last 20 plus months or so uh, that we need to be very dynamic and responsive into those unique needs for our students. Uh, we're a design thinking institution. We use those principles and understanding where people are. We, uh, we put students at the center of the conversation. Uh, they are the ones that we're paying attention to. We, we engage in a variety of activities, whether they're focus groups or, or individual meetings, one-on-one -on -one meetings where we're recording and asking questions to have a deeper insight into what their unique needs are. And uh, we're, we're really not comfortable with the surface level responses. And so we, we dig deeper within the conversations to find out what those unique needs are. We are highly given to uh, what I call the student customer and uh, trying to make sure that to the degree possible, we can, uh, we can find out what their needs are and uh, try to meet them and satiate them to the degree we can. Obviously some of the big learnings we've had is access to information and access to materials cost is a big one as well and i would also say that as part of this experience where we took the entire institution and we took it up to a up to, uh, 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 i guess online services uh, the whole institution really uh, we we've really found through that effort a, a um, i guess i would i would call it a a fungibility if you will of higher education uh, that students can kind of pick and choose what they want. They can go where they want to go. And so they're looking at the kinds of services and supports they get, particularly working remotely. And even now, as we're working through uh, the various iterations of COVID-19 and looking at the horizon for Omicron, we're, we're mindful of the fact that the majority of our students are still taking courses online. And we're actually trying to leverage this opportunity to help us be a little more global, more regional in our in our service to uh, the region and to the state and uh, the to multi-state region. So, so this, the second question I had was, why did Jackson College originally decide to 
provide an e-textbook and courseware program um, through BibliU? That's a great question, Dave, and it's, it's really at the heart of our, our work at the institution. And as I stated previously, we're really interested in looking at the unique individual and whole student. And what we find as we look historically about where we've been as a higher education institution, we've been inequitable in our responses and services and supports that we've been able to provide to students. Now, this was particularly apparent when COVID came along and we had to put everything up to the ether of the internet. What BibliU has provided is, number one, a very low cost solution for students to have instructional materials on the first day of class, and they can access this remotely. And so for me, uh, our partnership with you and the great team of BibliU has allowed us to move with, with great alacrity on a short period of time uh, where we were uh, exiting a, a, a previous um, a bookstore partner uh, you and your team came in and had the ability to respond. So responsive time um, was excellent to us uh, and was important to us to make sure that we were ready for the fall semester. And you and your team uh, really filled the bill in that regard. So that was important to us and why we selected BibliU. But more importantly is the fact that BibliU has allowed us to address the equity challenge that many of our institutions face and making sure that we not only reduce the cost, of all of these learning materials for students, which was significant, especially for students who are in the hard sciences, nursing, allied health, engineering, those kinds of programs, those textbooks are very expensive. So reducing that cost is important, but equally important in the time of COVID and even now as some three quarters of our students remain online, being able to access that, informa access that information and those materials remotely is, is really great. And to the degree that we have students participating literally from all over the world, being able to access the same material and have it available on the first day. Those are all critical boxes that we needed to check in order to address the equity issues that we have been plagued with over, over the years. And BibliU has helped us to achieve that. Awesome. And working with you, um, Dan, it's been a pleasure. And as you say, I think when we started our partnership just before um, four kicked off. There was quite a limited window to, to, to essentially run, run a content program for all, all of your students in the first semester. And that obviously, uh, the range of time constraint challenges there. But I think, you know, I'm glad um, I'm glad our team could be very responsive and, you know, it's super easy working with your team as well. I think to get a project done like that in such a short frame of time, you need two teams that are really good at communication and really, you know, pushing in, in the right direction. And, and, and you touched on, um, you, you know, you had a previous um, pr previous supplier, a, a physical bookstore. So it'd be interesting to understand a bit more how that kind of physical bookstore worked and, and what specifically was like a key driver as to why you felt you maybe didn't need a physical store anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah, excellent. Excellent questions, Dave. And yeah, I, I, I too have appreciated the relationship with you and your and your team. You know, the, uh, the, the world has changed a lot, and certainly higher education has been kind of holding off, maybe even immune to what that change has been for some time. And, and COVID really took the cracks that we knew that were there and widened them even further and made them very, very apparent to us. And so in that regard, uh, we began to see that the bookstore in its traditional design was, was insufficient in order to meet the current emerging needs of our students. And in that regard, what we were continuing to find and frustrated by, frankly, is how long it took in order for us to get the actual printed material to our students. We engage not only with students here on campus, we also have remote students, and we also have a unique situation where we're providing education to student inmates in a variety of prisons within the state of Michigan where responsible for serving those uh, student inmates. And so being able to go in and provide those materials in a very controlled environment and have that information in a timely way, that uh, was becoming more, more challenging. Uh, in addition, there was continuing price point increases. Uh, literally, it was burdensome for some students who were paying some $600 even for, for some of our most expensive textbooks. And for students who are first generation, maybe single parent, they don't have a lot of resources, uh, whatever their personal situation might be, these are significant dollars. You know, we experimented with some changes that were happening in the industry, such as 
textbook rental and those kinds of things. They're, those are moving in the right direction, but much too slow for our need. And, and I think it might work for some institutions, but not for Jackson College. We're a pretty innovative institution. We're very focused on meeting students where they are. And we've got to respond to the fact that they're not where they used to be. <laughs> they're online. Uh, they're in prison. Uh, they're across the globe. And so in that regard, uh, having the materials on time is important. And uh, this challenge was even more exacerbated, Dave, because one of the ways that we're serving our student customer better is we're reducing the amount of time necessary to complete their education. So rather than having a 15-week semester, we've taken the same amount of instructional period and reduced it to a seven-week term. And so the material is the same. The contact time is the same. The responsibilities are the same. It's just a shorter period of time. So you can imagine if a textbook shows up two weeks late on a seven-week term, we've already put the student at a huge disadvantage on top of that. So there are a number of, of elements here, whether we're providing prison education or shorter periods of time for student learning. All of these have moved at a pace faster than the traditional bookstore environment. And what BibliU has been able to do is recognize that our institution is, is innovative and moving forward. And you folks have walked along with us on that journey. And uh, as we have presented the challenges to you, you and your team have responded in kind. And that's made the difference for us. And more importantly, it's made the difference for our students. Yeah, that's really great to hear, Dan. As actually, I mentioned, I, I came to D Detroit um, two weeks ago. Unfortunately, we didn't get the chance to, to meet in person, but I'm sure we will next time. But I went down to um, South Piedmont Community College in um, in uh, North Carolina and uh, met, met with the team there. We're, we're just doing a little pilot there with them at the moment. But um, one of the uh, staff, that the CAO, he actually said that he thought – what we're doing is a bit more kind of like if you think of Netflix and Blockbuster, that's kind of a bit like the transition that's 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 kind of what we're looking to 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 bring to the space. And as you say, it's key to ensure access as quickly as possible for the students day one, ideally prior to day one, and also you know get get that cost down because it's really you know it's 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 really unaffordable for for a large group of our students. And talking to suiting the individual needs, you know, it's it's not really okay to offer something that only a small group of the students can can, can afford. Um, so I wanted to talk a bit about um, diversity and inclusion initiatives as well, and 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 understand whether you have any of those currently going on at Jackson College. Yes, uh, we have a rather extensive uh, approach to diversity and social justice inclusion, uh, equity issues across the whole of the institution. Uh, in that regard, we have. Um, specific programs uh, related to unique audiences, uh, programs like what we call Men of Merit, uh, Sisters of Strength, particularly around the African-American community, in a, in a way to be able to serve other individuals at a higher level and having the communications we need to more deeply understand the unique needs of our diverse students, we had to have even more insight into what design thinking principles could provide us. And so in that regard, uh, we engaged in a, in a process and an initiative that we call um, uh, affinity groups. And so we identified the various uh, unique communities in our broader communities. So whether they are East Indian or Hispanic or African American, we actually created jobs for people on our campus with the sole purpose of serving as a liaison to those audiences. And through that, we have been able to get even deeper insights into the students. So we may have some students who are Hispanic. Maybe they're here uh, because they were, uh, they were brought here as a young child. They're concerned about their education and future. They'd like to get an education. Maybe they're undocumented and they're needing our help. And so we are getting insights that we have not had before. Our work with African-American males to find out that they are less successful than their female peers in fact, of all of our student groups, they are the least successful, historically speaking. Uh, having an opportunity to chat with them, provide student supports, academic programs, summer bridge programs to help them build their academic skill sets up so they're ready for, uh, for college, to be able to live in our housing. Now, these are all uh, parts of initiatives that we have been engaging in to better understand the, the breadth and the depth of our, our broad and diverse communities. 
Thanks, Dan. It's re really positive to hear. I, th I think it's so important, in, in to, to, particularly today more than ever, to have to have these initiatives to ensure that, again, to your point, and, and, and looking at every individual student and ensuring that every individual has, has what they need to succeed. I think from a diversity and inclusion perspective, is even more of a reason to, to, to be focused and in investing in, in, in these areas. Um, and and in, in in terms of um, the future, I know you touched on you know your strategy and values. What what what, what, what do you th see in terms of the future in terms of diversity and inclusion initiatives, and and what could what what could be done in the future, and, and what what you'd like to see in the future? Well, I would say that we are taking a deeper dive on having more more uh, personal, more dedicated relationships with individual students. So it's going to take more time and more resources, more people, frankly, to make sure that we have a deep and abiding relationship with every student who comes into our institution. And so that means that we need to understand their unique challenges and figuring out, you know, what are the resources we can bring to bear? That we, are, we will be doing a better job of making sure that we understand their goal and we're helping them make reasonable progression further uh, to, to make sure that we don't let a student fail, that uh, they've got to work against us in order to fail at our institution. That's, that's kind of where I'm heading, that you, you've got to want to fail on purpose. If you bring your A game to it and we bring our A game, there's no reason that you should leave here without some kind of credential of market value or transfer to a baccalaureate granting institution. And so uh, there's a lot of research to uh, SESI and other organizations would point out that if a few people know your name and understand your situation, understand the road you have been walking on. Uh, if you have that kind of a relationship, whether it's a faculty member or even the groundskeeper, if you have that kind of relationship within the institution, the likelihood of you persisting and completing is much higher. So uh, that also suggests that we have a greater reliance on data, the ability to acquire and interpret and utilize data to guide us in, in serving each student. I've also engaged in conversations with our local su school superintendents to figure out not only the students that we're working with right now on dual enrollment and traditional transfer, but there is a number of students who are being lost in the system, individuals who drop out of high school, individuals who might complete with a high school certificate or a high school diploma, but they may not pursue higher education. It is fundamentally clear based on Georgetown research and many other organizations that some kind of post-secondary credential is important. I think that's why in the States, uh, the government and many others have been pushing for a free community college because they know that higher education, at least at the two-year level, should be as ubiquitous as the high school diploma. Well, uh, that being said, not everybody is achieving the high school diploma uh, in its entirety, and, and there are quite a few who aren't pursuing post-secondary education at all. So a greater aggressiveness on our part to be able to work with our K through 12 counterparts to make sure these individuals actually aren't lost in the system, that they don't become a drag on the social sector, that they're not uh, becoming a burden to the community, but in fact are fully engaged in the community, that they're not consuming resources, they're actually building into the community, they're paying taxes, they have a job, and so we don't have to worry about healthcare issues or safety or security issues or our social sector support issues, that people are, are engaged, that people feel cared about, and we don't have to worry about um, other societal challenges that may come as a result of, of dropping out of high school or, or not pursuing an education which could lead uh, to a meaningful and robust and um, economically sound and sustainable life for them and, and their families. That's a really a really positive future that I'll, I also really get behind and, and think if we can move in, in that direction, as you've outlined, Dan. I, I think the key in what, what we try to achieve in education, both you, yourself as a, as a community college, our, our, ourselves as an ed tech startup, is increase social mobility and any of these diversity and inclusion initiatives that, that, that can help with that and particularly uh, I think address you know some of the gaps that already exist in terms of um, the, 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 the different groups and what, what they tend to kind of end up with after college if we can address some of these gaps not only are we addressing diversity and inclusion specifically and making a kind of more just and equitable society but also achieving social mobility which I think is so important for people to to, to, to have 
you know, f- f- faith in their institutions, faith in their country, and and optimism for the future, and more importantly, the outlook for their children and grandchildren as well. Um, awesome. So I'll just wrap up with one last question, Dan. Um, how, how's it been like working with BibliU so far? And and is there any honest feedback you could give us in terms of how we can be better for the future? Sure, sure. Well, um, first of all, I would I would say, Dave, you refer to uh, BibliU as a startup. I would say the way you're behaving uh, feels like a company has been around for a good long time. Uh, certainly, your commitment, your team's commitment to your partners, Jackson College in this case, has just been great. And uh, always with new relationships and new organizations, there are a few bumps along the road. But the one thing that I, I tip my hat to you for is that you folks have been on the ball. You've responded in, with great alacrity in meeting whatever challenges we might face. Uh, the speed at which you were able to gain even more titles that we needed for our organization has been great. Um, I fear that my, my relationship uh, with you might be ta- tarnished a little bit since I wasn't uh, here when you came. I was at a conference, but the way that I'm playing that, Dave, is I'm thinking I'm coming over to the UK <laughs> and, and seeing you. That's that's my game plan. <clears throat> but um, uh, but in terms of uh, our overall relationship with, with BibliU, I, I could not be more pleased. Uh, we have and are currently taking what used to be our bookstore and remaking it into a very different space in our institution. It's a it's a confluence of of a lots of things, and uh, I just think the idea of a traditional bookstore is is gone the way of the dodo bird. <laughs> and and uh, we are we're entering into a new space thanks to BibliU and uh, and your leadership and uh, your team and working with us. Ultimately. Uh, the point you made earlier, which is exactly right, you know, it would be very limiting. It would be improper for for anyone to refer to BibliU as a textbook company, uh, because BibliU, in my view, is a lot greater than that. Uh, BibliU is about uh, enhancing and making social and economic mobility possible, and you do that by cost reduction and by availability of necessary educational and resource systems that are so important for our students to have on the first day, recognizing that finances are a challenge and distance is a challenge. And so in that regard, uh, you know, I, I've also had to change the way that we think about higher education. We're, we're not a higher education institution. We're not a teaching institution. We're, a, we're in the business of human development. So when you, when you shift the way that you think about your organization, whether it's Jackson College or it's BibliU, a lot more is possible. And uh, in my view, it takes people who are very innovative, like BibliU, like you, Dave, and your team to come together and support institutions like Jackson College that are, that are looking forward to uh, advancing humanity, uh, advancing human development, and, and seriously engaged in the work. And uh, we try to do the best that we can to find the right people to work with through our hiring process, but also with our partner process like BibliU. And so I am, I'm grateful to no end uh, to, to BibliU for, for the focus you have, because you see beyond instructional materials, you see economic and social mobility, you see the challenges of, of students and what they face on a day-to-day basis, and you see the unevenness that is out there in terms of uh, knowledge, skills, and abilities of the people that we're trying to serve, and you try to figure out how do we step into that breach and support institutions like ours in doing that work. Uh, I appreciate that, Dan. I think it, it's it's the sort of thing that um, takes two to tango. I think you know w- w- when you get this kind of alignment in terms of both values and also taking um, initiative and, and doing things in an innovative manner. You know, BBU Jackson College can really achieve a lot. And and I really I really like that point. I think we do need to start thinking of ourselves as more than. A platform and more more than textbooks we actually have um and we'd love to do a study with jackson at some point we've done a study at coventry university here in the uk and grand canyon university in the us both quite different institutions to to, to to yours but both have shown that by getting those um getting the content to the students in day one you can increase student retention by about five percent so really positive to see and these are quite recent studies so we've been you know running for, for five or six years now and as you say yeah pr- pr- probably a bit larger than a startup more, more in kind of the the, the scale-up phase but um we haven't seen this data until recently. And so we, we could tell, you could feel that there was a really positive impact being realized. But when you get this data back, it just kind of confirms like what you said, that that it, it's more than just um, higher education. It's more than just textbooks. It's about, you know, 
student retention, student engagement, student success. So it's a student's important at, at the end of the day. So Dan, I will wrap it up there. Thank you so much for jumping on. 